No, Matt, no, Mark writes. <clears throat> then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him, saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Mm, no. <laughs> That's it. You know, and I, every time I have to say, you read through this, you just live, oh, you never preach on this one statement, but that's a dangerous thing to ask Jesus, don't you think? Wow. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? They said to him, grant us that we may sit one at your right hand and the other at your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, you do not know, you do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said to him, we are able. I, I can make this. So Jesus then said to them, you will indeed drink the cup that I will drink and the baptism I am baptized with, you will be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it is for those whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, uh, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. But Jesus called them to himself and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall be not so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. Please be seated. I really like this cartoon in context of what we just read. The cartoon says, they forgot to ask if I'm certified for this shift, but how hard could it be? <laughs> And I think it's great. He has no idea what he's in line for. So what's the issue in the cartoon? He's not he is not prepared, is he? He's not qualified, is he, for what he's about to endure, right? And I thought about it, and I saw this cartoon, I thought it was so appropriate for today's gospel text. As James and John asked Jesus one of the most bizarre questions anyone could ever have asked him. So the theme for today, if you give me that, oh, thank you, it's your unit. Are you qualified? And I thought about that this morning. Are we qualified? Have you ever applied for a job when you weren't qualified? <laughs> when I was coming out of college and got my bachelor's and did not get the job I thought I was going to get, I began to send out my resumes and my, my, my Christian uh, Bible teacher during college said to me, hey, Chris, I know someone who's looking for a manager at a local auto parts firm. What do you think? I said, okay, I'll, let me go apply. And uh, basically, I knew three things about cars. <laughs> Besides putting the key in and how to put gas in, I knew how to change the oil and change the tire. That was the extent of the knowledge I knew about cars. So when I met with Gordon, I gave him my best smile and told him, I don't know anything really about cars, but I'm willing to learn. And I used to work in a gas station at one time in my younger years. And he said, you're hired. And I'll tell you why I was hired. I was the youth director at the church next to his. And he knew it, and he knew my faith. And he hired me because of my faith, not because of my ability. And, um, <clears throat> And so we started working, and I would listen to every mechanic that came in the door and learn from them all about cars. And I would take time, I'd spend 16 hours a day learning about cars. And I learned how to rebuild a carburetor, I learned how to change brakes, I learned how, how to rebuild an engine in the process, because we had a machine shop as well as the auto parts firm. And it was great, and Gordon said, just keep doing what you're doing, you're doing fine, and then I'm gonna go on vacation. I had been three months into my job. I said, oh, this is just dandy, as long as nothing goes wrong. Well, on the Wednesday, while Gordon was gone on vacation, the power went out. And it wiped out all of our hard drives. And all of our records of all of our engine machine shop work. 
which were detailed. So on Thursday, when I got back to work at 6 a.m., <clears throat> I started rebooting the computers and getting them up and then realized that all the paperwork that we put in the computers was gone. It was a stack this thick. I had 10 engines I had to re-put into the computer. So I did the best I could and Gordon came back and I said, hey, I heard you had a problem. I said, yes, we did. I did the best I can, but you better double check them because they're probably not all correct. And he was gracious enough to say, hey, it wasn't your problem. But one of the great things about working with Gordon is we would work all day and then at night we'd close the books and go to the bank, come back to the office and bring the bag back. And we would talk about Jesus every night for about two hours. It was so cool. I love Gordon. Gordon was a great example. When I called Gordon, I said, Gordon, I'm leaving to go to the seminary. He says, that's where you belong. And so Gordon was a great man. I, I went to his funeral. He died of, of congestive heart failure a few years later when I went to seminary. But I gave thanks that he, he allowed me, the unqualified one, to work for him. I thought that was so powerful. I learned so much from him. But I want to give you a quick slide here. There's a quick, quick little um, thing here. I thought this was kind of fun. Um, Daniel, can you read that for me? I can't. It's kind of hard for me. I admit, Harold's cardiologist wasn't the most qualified, but he had such a compelling personal narrative. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dan. I just thought that was really funny. I just thought that was, you know, sometimes you can bluff your way through things. But anyway, but as I thought about this being qualified, it really hit me that it's really dangerous what happens in our text for this morning about are we qualified. And so if you give me the next slide, danger ahead. As I reflected on the rich, drunk, young ruler last week, <clears throat> and we talked about the transactional versus transformational relationship, at which point the young ruler was unable to do what Jesus asked him to do and left that visitation depressed and down. And I wondered, did the disciples hear what Jesus had told the rich, young ruler when he was before them? Did they understand, or were they just as perplexed and just let it go right over their head of the message that he was giving to them? And I, I wonder if James and John heard anything of what Jesus had told the rich, young ruler during his message. And I don't think they did either, do you? And what's even more critical about our story is something takes place in between that story and the gospel text we read this morning. I'm going to read it for you. This is what Jesus said after the rich young ruler, but before we hear the story, according to Mark. He says, <clears throat> Now they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was going before them, and they were amazed. And as they followed him, they were afraid. He took the twelve aside again and said, began to tell them these things, that what would happen to him. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will contempt, condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles, and they will mock him, scourge him, and spit on him, and kill him. And then on the third day, he will rise again. Jesus just told the disciples this message before James and John come to him to ask them the very absurd question that they ask him. He's telling them for the very third time that he is going to Jerusalem, the Son of Man is going to Jerusalem, and they're going to radically kill him. They're going to destroy him. They're going to do everything they can to discredit Jesus. Man. He gives them this great warning. When, where does it go? And sometimes I wonder, maybe they're caught up in the social, political things of what's going on in their culture. They're all so entrenched with who Jesus is in the very present, they can't begin to even think what could happen to him down the road. And I thought about, then they asked this great question of grandeur. Jesus has just told them, what's up? He just told what's about to take place in the next few days, the next few weeks, however this time frame is. And then yet they say, grant us that we may sit one at your right and one at your left in your glory. And I began to wonder why they asked that question. When you think about it, I want you to hear this for a second. I want you to think about James and John for a minute. They're not bad people. They're not selfish people, I don't believe. 
Then you get a little power hungry. But not a parent. They're not like that. But I want you to think about James and Jonah and how come they missed something. As I thought about James not asking this question, it hit me. Why are they asking this in the first place? They're already part of Jesus' inner circle. Think about it. They are part of Jesus' inner circle, folks. When you read the scripture, they tell stories. And on, on 12 different places in the Gospels, James and John's name is mentioned at the top of the list. Jesus goes up to the mountain. Who's he going with? Peter and who? And John. After Andrew gets Peter to be a disciple, who's next? James and John, the sons of Zebedee, sons of thunder. Where are they on the list? When, when the scriptures, when lists are created, they're created for a purpose to show priority and who's, who's has a higher priority. So when you see the list of disciples, you have Peter and Andrew, and then you have James and John, and then everybody else follows suit afterwards. They're already at the top of the list. They're already part of God's kingdom plan, and they're part of what Jesus is looking forward to throughout the text. Even when Peter goes to this place and they're going to heal this woman, and Jesus says, come on, Peter, come on, Andrew, and James and John, but the rest of you stay outside. Hello? You're James and John. Where are you on the list with Jesus? How tight are you with Jesus? Pretty tight, wouldn't you say? And so that's what amazes me about why they ask this foolish question. When it comes time for you to sit in the kingdom, we want to sit one at your right and one at your left. And I thought, how crazy. They're already in the upper echelon of the relationship between the disciples and Jesus. They're in the top four. That's not a bad place to be. In fact, if you think of football, you think of the college football situation, the top four teams get to go to the playoffs. It's changing this year, but up until this year, the top four teams get to go to the college playoffs. Well, Peter, James, and John are part of that top four along with Andrew. So why do they ask this question? They want to drive the car. <laughs> What's that? Because they want to drive the car. You know, that's really, we were talking, we were talking a little bit this in our Bible study on Tuesday with the pastors. I said, I raised this question and they said, yeah, you know, it's, they're kind of, it's really funny. They don't, don't, they don't want, they're not happy with positions three and four is what the issue is. They want to be one and two. And Peter and Andrew are one and two. So I thought that was really, really funny. And so it's, Jesus must be looking at them like, hello? What's, what's wrong with you? And so Jesus, the human is like, says, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. He doesn't rebuke them. He doesn't tell them off. He says, wait a minute. As the ultimate teacher, Jesus gives them this great rhetorical question. Think about the question he gives them. And that's the one we're kind of laughing at when I was reading the text. But, <clears throat> but then Jesus says to them, you do not know what you ask. Right? Says the most profound thing, and they this is gonna go. Shh. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I will be baptized with? Amen. Your kids are here. Hmm. Don't you think that should have been their response when Jesus said that? If you're James and John, is it your response? Hmm. Let me think about what you just said, Jesus. Let me get back to you on that, Jesus. I think I heard what you said, Jesus. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get back to you. Wait a minute, Jesus. I'm gonna get back to you because I just heard something really profound, and I heard something that really I'm not sure about. I'm not really sure I can drink the cup. I'm not really sure that I can be baptized in baptism. You're gonna be baptized with because I don't know what you're talking about. They don't have a clue what he's talking about. You think they? Hey. In school, when a teacher says something that makes no sense, how many of you raise your hands and teacher, I don't understand? <laughs> you know? Hello, Jesus, we don't get this. We don't understand a thing you just told us. We don't have a clue. Wait a minute, please explain this before we go any further with this discussion, right? Isn't that a great response? Don't you think that's a legitimate response? Yeah. Don't you think that's a faithful response? Yeah. I think so. Wait for it. Wait for it. And they respond. We are able. <laughs> really? We are able. What are, okay, what are they drinking? 
already? They've been with him for three years. They heard nothing. They heard nothing. Then Jesus says to them, now get this. Then Jesus says to them, you are indeed. What does that mean? You are indeed. What does that mean? It's going to happen. It's going to happen. You will indeed drink the cup that I drink, and with the baptism I am baptized, you will be baptized. And what do we all say? Praise the Lord. Oh, heck no, I'm out of here. <laughs> you think that would have been the clue, right? You think James and John would have said, well, Jesus, you know, you got something. There's something to what you're saying here, Jesus. There's something here to what you were saying. I think we better change our mind. We withdraw that first question. But they don't. I don't get it. They don't understand the depth and the breadth of who Jesus is. It's really funny. The apostle, the best disciple who wasn't a disciple was the apostle Peter, uh, Paul. He gets what Jesus says, but unfortunately, he has the, the issue of seeing the resurrection. He's post resurrection. But his statement is so great, I just want to share it with you. Romans 6 3. Paul says, to the Romans. For surely you know when you were baptized into the union with Christ Jesus, you were baptized into the union with his death. That would have been a nice clause Jesus could have kind of put in there along with you. You get baptized, you can be baptized into my death. Then I think this, they may have said something different. Or they may have just missed it like everything else. So James and John think they can do it. And then Jesus says, okay, all right, it's going to happen to you, but it's not going to happen like you think. That's what he just said. And then he closes off this whole little dialogue with them by saying, but to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it's for those to whom it is prepared. Silence. And then, and then, give me the next slide. The disciples say, hold on. Hold on. Who do you think you are? We're in this picture too. And I'm sure this is Peter leading the charge against the, the James and John. Say, hold on. Who do you think you are? Wait just a minute. What do you think you're trying to pull? Who do you think you are taking Andrew in my place with Jesus? Doesn't say that, but you can hear Peter, right? I can hear Peter putting foot in mouth and saying, okay, Jesus, I, I'm going to say if you're not. Because the scripture says, and when the ten heard it, they began to greatly be displeased with James and John. Can you imagine the tension that arose after that moment? We kind of slide it under the table, but you can imagine the chaos that was before Jesus. And he hasn't even gotten into Jerusalem yet. It's, the chaos is not with Jerusalem. It's not with the Pharisees. It's not with the seven. It's with the twelve. He's got chaos with the twelve. They're a mess. Because James and John decide to say, okay, we're going to change the order. We're going to be first and second here, and Andrew can be third and fourth, and so on and so forth. And the disciples say, oh, no, it's not going to be that way. They're about to crash. They're about to crash. You're right, Scotty. I can imagine we just get, this is the real tension we get between the disciples and each other in all the Gospels. It's the only tension moment we got. Can you imagine? They're hanging, these are 12 men hanging out with Jesus and some other women and all that, hanging around with Jesus. I can imagine there were other tensions, but somehow they didn't get recorded. But this one did. That's so easy for us to get broken up and get messed up by selfish desires, right? So James and John got a, Jesus got a whole mess on his hands. And he's beginning to try to figure them out, trying to tell them what's going on with all the challenges that's before him. Jesus has got Jerusalem in his sights. You know, you've you got something in your sights. You know what I mean? Get something planned. You know this is in front of you. You got it going, and if you're ready, and you know, and you're, you're focused, and you're ready to make that next step in your life, in your journey, and Jesus knows what that journey looks like. He knows that the road into Jerusalem is not going to be glorious. 
except for a moment in time when they, when they all scream, Hosanna, King of Kings. But at that moment, the rest of that week in Jerusalem, before he gets crucified, it's going to be one, joke, one giant mess. He's, got, he's focused on that. And here on the other side, his beloved disciples, his 12, whom he had chosen, are a hot mess. And where does he need them? They need to come with him, right? They need to go with Jesus. They need to be over here with Jesus. And they're over here squabbling about who's the greatest, who, who's going to sit at the right and left of Jesus when he comes into his kingdom. Because they think, they think when Jesus goes over here to Jerusalem, guess what? What are they thinking? They think he's going to kick some you-know-what. And when he kicks you-know-what, then he's going to take over and become power. And he's going to replace Pilate. He's going to replace the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he's going to sit on top of his throne, and they're going to sit next to him and be his court. And Jesus goes, no. No. You've got to drink the cup. you can be baptized with my baptism. They're going. In, they're both going in opposite directions, and they don't know. Jesus knows it, but they don't. And Jesus just looks at them, and he gets that they're in the wrong place. He understands that they don't know what it means to drink the cup. Jesus understands that, that they are not ready to be his baptism into death. They don't get it. And the craziest thing about it is Jesus says, okay, let me tell you another way. Well, let's put the cup aside. Let's put the baptism aside. Let me come another way. And then, if you give me that slide, look what Jesus says. Okay, guys, let me get your attention. Focus on me, he says. Whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. Okay, we put the cup aside, we put the baptism aside, we just give service. It's not about you. It's about who you are for others. Who are you for others? This is it. That you become a slave for all. So, Jerry, yeah. you got to be Lydia's slave. <laughs> I thought you'd like that. <laughs> Scotty, you got to be Lori's slave. Annette, you better be Raul's slave. And she's going, no. But that's what he's saying. You gotta surrender yourself for the other. You gotta give up what is important to you for the other. You gotta be there for the other. You gotta work and serve the other with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. And Jesus is giving him this great line. And then he's not done that. Then go to the next line. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Here's the cup. This is the cup. This is the baptism he was talking about to James and John and the whole disciple crew a few moments ago. Because he's letting them know that I am going to be the ransom for all of you. And then if I do that, then you need to serve one another as one another's slaves. The Greek word is diakonai, to be servant for the other. Because when I'm crucified and died, you really need to stick together and be one and really work hard for who I am and what it means to know me so that my message will get out. You can't be all divided about what you think is important because the only thing that's important is Christ. He didn't say that, I'm saying that. Because they have to get it together and understand it's the message of Christ that must get out. Is really what the challenge to the disciples is. If you're going to be baptized into his death, as Paul said in Romans 6, 3, then we too have to be baptized into his death so that Christ's message can be made out. That I can die to myself, that Christ may come out of me. That's the message. 
That's the message Jesus is implying. He says, you've got to drink the cup and you've got to be baptized with wine. Baptism, you've got to surrender yourself for the sake of who Christ is. That's really what Jesus is giving them. They just don't know yet because Christ hasn't become Christ yet because he hasn't died and rose. But Jesus understands because he knows that that's what the cup means. He knows what that death means because he knows on the third day he will rise. He told them that. And I think for the power of what this word and this message becomes for us is that we've got to surrender ourselves. We've got to become servants of all. We have to be servants of God. We have to be servants of our community to be ready to help our community, to meet the needs of our community, to surrender what we think is important for the message of Christ to be made known. See, that's the power of this text. And I got to thinking, that was the challenge for the rich young ruler last week. He could not surrender. His bag. He couldn't surrender his sack. Remember that? He couldn't surrender his sack. He couldn't get rid of it. And you know, the rich young ruler is no different than our disciples in our story today, right? Is he? They're caught up in their things too, aren't they? And yet Jesus tells us. I came not to be served, but to serve. That's the message to us. We are not here to be served, but to serve. We're here to surrender ourselves, to drink the cup, and be baptized with Jesus' baptism by death and resurrection. That's the power of the story. That's the challenge to James and John because they say they can drink the cup, but we all know, can they? No. Not yet. Not yet. In time. But in the moment in time in the story, not yet. And the question for us is are we ready to drink that cup? And be baptized with that baptism? Because that's what Christ is calling us to. That's what Paul is calling to us in Romans 6. Are you ready to be baptized unto his death? And to drink the cup that he drinks. That's the challenge. You say yes to that question, when? Every time you take communion. From now on, every time you take communion, you need to ask yourself prior to coming and taking communion, am I willing to really drink this cup and take on Jesus' baptism in my life? It's a hard question. But it's one of service, remember? Not being served. And how do we do that? How do we let go of the things we think are James and John couldn't in our story. But eventually, they did. And they drank it.